materials, uh, inventions, thought process, those were all premiums. Agriculture, uh, prime land was a premium here. And then we, we get out of the industrial and we get into the depression. As we get into the depression, there was such a premium on capital. You know, you could do anything if you had capital, but you couldn't get your hands on any capital. You know, if you look at that, so what is the premium on today? What is the premium economics? What is it on? It's on people. It's on people. And people that realize that and go out and get the doers and treat them fair, turn them loose, give them an opportunity in their life to do what they want to do and not try any top-down. I've never, ever been a top-down manager. I've always tried to be a bottom-up manager. But more than that, I've tried to give my people an opportunity to do something for themselves. From a selfish standpoint, from a very selfish standpoint, the Senate does much, for you, much more for a person than that person can really do for the Senate or his constituents, in my opinion. You know, since I have been in the Senate, I have served on practically every committee in the Senate. I've served on judiciary. I've served on conservation, which handles everything to do with land, air, and sea. And I've served on corporations, which is the business community of the Senate. I've sat on the Rules Committee, which makes the rules. I've sat six years on Senate Finance and four years on Legislative Finance Committee. And it, you learn so much. You know, I, I could say each one of those committee assignments is like a degree in college. You just learn so much. You just, you broaden your mind and your, your perception. You know, after all, you know, what we think is true is really what we perceive. And that perception, you know, is, is so expanded uh, when you get into the Senate and when you get to hear all the bills and all the argument and all the debate on almost any subject you want to talk about. So uh, the most rewarding thing is, is very selfishly, I guess, is what it's done for me personally. Life gets you what you bargain for. You know, you can bargain for a penny, it'll give you a penny. You can bargain for a dollar, it'll give you a dollar. Life will give you the opportunity. The problem I've had with so many people and my friends, see, I, I'm much older now, but when I go back and people say, well, you're lucky, you know, you're so lucky, you know. Well, it isn't luck, it never was luck. It's the fact that how many of my friends said, well, I could have done something like that, and geez, I had this wonderful opportunity, or gee whiz, I had this other wonderful opportunity. But the timing wasn't right. It just wasn't right for me to do it. I think the young students graduating today, the advice I can give them, timing will never be right. Timing will never be right. You know, you will be rewarded according to the risk you're willing to assume. And that's just part of the business world. So when opportunity does present itself, don't sit back and say, well, it's just the timing isn't right. You either got to accept that opportunity and go with it. And once you accept it, burn all the bridges behind you. Don't say, gee, what am I going to do if this doesn't work out? Commit yourself 100% to it. Burn all the bridges you can behind you. Go ahead and be successful in that endeavor. And then if you're successful in that endeavor and want to change to something else, then that's fine. I couldn't go, I, I couldn't go back and live the life over. I wouldn't want to because I don't think it would come out as good as it has. <laughs> I really say that in all sincerity, you know, because it seems like, you know, the, as you know, the only tragedy I've had in my life was the loss of my oldest son, which happened about five years ago, you know, but the rest of my life is, man, you know, I'm like the guy said, uh, I was talking to a very good friend of mine the other day down here on the, <clears throat> Bob Browning, and he and Bob and I started out about the same time, we're almost the same age. I went this way in the insurance business, he went in the real estate. And Bob has been quite successful in the real estate business. And you know, I met Bob the other day and we were talking around and I said, uh, I said, Bob, you know, God's been good to you and me, hadn't he? And he said, yeah, aren't you glad he didn't give us what we deserve? <laughs> you know, and I, I think that's probably true. <laughs> so, so I don't know, maybe there's a lot of truth in that statement, you know.
Well, he was in the merchandising business. We had a general store and sold everything from axle grease to nuts, you know, and, and uh, he developed a very successful business. He only had a third grade education, but he had a tremendous ability to uh, learn from people. And he had two people that he visited practically every day. They were his, you might call his professors, but uh, they were learning as much about people as, as he was. But he would learn, uh, he would learn from Mr. Rogers, who was an attorney and uh, an Englishman, born, uh, went to school at Michigan, highly educated person. And uh, my dad would pick his brain and, and would learn a lot of things from him. And then there was uh, Arthur Ilfeld, who was a principal of uh, the Charles Ilfeld Company, one of the great merchandising, merchandise companies in New Mexico. And uh, they became great friends and bought a lot of groceries from him and visited with him on a very frequent basis. And there again, he got to be a real scholar of the market by uh, pick, picking his brain on stocks. And the stockbrokers, when they'd come from Denver, they'd get off the tra train and they'd go over to the Charles Ilfeld Company and they'd have a list of stocks that they suggested, a lot of food stocks. And so my dad says, well, have him drop by and see me, you know. So my dad would say, well, what did Charles buy? <laughs> well, I want to buy the same thing. So consequently, he, in his portfolio of stocks, uh, he had a lot of good uh, stocks, you know, Procter & Gamble and a lot of good food stocks, corn products, and and did very well in the stock market. He got to be kind of like a scholar of the market, made a lot of money in the stock market. Well, the store was kind of like our playgrounds. You know, as a youngster, we used to take our naps on the, uh, on the overalls, you know, and uh, we used to play on top of the sacks of flour. And I had a next door neighbor that uh, was trying to learn English, so I, I taught him how to speak English, and he taught me Spanish. So that's how I learned Spanish. But we had a lot of fond memories in the store. We bottled wine in the left, and we sold flour in the back, and and uh, we had quite a conglomerate of businesses right there. And uh, we sold everything from soup to nuts. We had a great portfolio of customers and customers from the country, you know, would come in and they'd come in their horse and buggy and then my dad figured, well, maybe I better put up a, that was our first venture into the motel business. We had a couple of uh, buildings in the back that were converted and, and we had a water trough for the horses and, and they'd come in, you know, and they'd make a, a real big deal out of it. They would they would uh, buy their provisions for months, you know. And then the night before, they'd give my dad all their money and they'd say, here, we're gonna go out on the town tonight, so just let me have a few bucks and I'll see you in the morning. So they'd go out on the town and the next morning they'd come in and buy all their groceries. They'd buy a lot of groceries. I mean, two, 3,000 pounds of flour, you know, and, and uh, uh, just about everything that they needed, you know. Well, the nuns at the Immaculate Conception, the first grade nuns, uh, first grade nun and the fourth grade nun and the eighth grade nun, they had a, a big impact on my life. And Father Rabro, who was the uh, pastor, he was a Frenchman, and uh, every month he'd come and read our report cards and the only thing he was really interested in was if the tuition was paid in full. <laughs> and when he, he'd rattle out the grades and then he'd say, tuition paid in full, very good, very good. <laughs> but you he, he had to give him a great, a lot of credit. He came and built a school in, 19, in the early 20s, you know, and it was hard times. And uh, he had to raise the money and and, uh, and he did it. He built a beautiful school. It's still 
prettiest building in town, the white brick. And uh, so I, I was an altar boy for him and made a few quarters after serving, helping him serve mass. Well, I went to uh, University of New Mexico and, you know, all my life I'd been so involved in, in the business and so interested in the business that I couldn't concentrate on my work, you know, my college work. So I figured maybe I better get out of town and, and try that. So I did. I moved to uh, Las Cruces and went to New Mexico State and that was the best thing I could have done because that gave me an opportunity to to really concentrate on my studies and and uh, I enjoyed New Mexico State. They had some great professors and uh, I learned a lot in the business college. I, uh, I think it's one of the finest universities in the country. They've had some great leadership there. Dean Guthrie was uh, was a sponsor of ours. I was a member of the SAE fraternity and he was a sponsor and so I got to know him pretty well and he was a class act and uh, Curtis Graham, I knew Curtis Graham, I liked him very much and now Dean uh, Arnold is carrying the torch and looks like he's doing an outstanding job as running the business school in New Mexico State. I think it's a great institution with some great programs, great teachers, and, and you can build a good foundation on what you learn in New Mexico State. I'm very glad that I went there. President Eisenhower had just been elected, you know, on I Like Ike, and so I kind of hitchhiked on that and uh, copycat, and, and my slogan was, uh, I like Mike. And uh, we worked hard, and we put up a lot of posters, and I won the election against a, a real football star. So it was kind of an upset election, but, but we won that election, and it was, it was a great victory. Well, the beer came on after repeal. You know, the uh, repeal of prohibition was in 1933. And uh, so my dad figured, well, we used to sell a lot of sugar to bootleggers in the grocery store. <laughs> so they'd come in and they'd buy their sugar and their groceries and everything else. Well, then after repeal, they didn't have to make bootleg anymore. They wanted to buy it already bottled. So my dad got involved in a, in a bar uh, with Ramon Mace. His grandson is now Senator Ramon Mace here in Santa Fe. And uh, so he, he was running the bar and my dad was running the grocery store and my dad was a great merchant. He's a great buyer, you know. He could, he could trade and he could buy, you know. So he started doing the liquor buying and before you know it he was buying truckloads and selling it to uh, people that used to be bootleggers and they were buying now in, in full cases. So one of, the, of our competitors, one of the liquor competitors, got mad at my dad and turned him into the state uh, liquor board for not having a license to be a wholesaler. So when the inspectors came out, they asked him, well, if you, somebody wants uh, few cases, will you sell it to them? She says, sure, you know, as long as their credit is good or if they have the cash, why, I'll sell them whatever they want. He said, well, you're in violation of state law because you're not supposed to sell more than two gallons or whatever the limit was. So that's how he got in the wholesale liquor business, by taking out a license. I would say so. I think honesty is very, very important. I mean, our customers really trusted my dad, and uh, they'd trust him with, with their life, you know. And I think so honesty is, is, uh, is real important. Hard work, uh, hard work has been something that's very important to our family. We're not afraid of hard work. And uh, so I'd say honesty and hard work and a dedication to the customer taking really taking care of the customer. That's been the secret of our success. 
Well, there's a lot of opportunities that present themselves, and you want to do it just as an individual, but going to funerals, I think, is important. Going to rosaries is important. Um, taking care of the customer when they need something, whatever it might be, um, moving or uh, looking for opportunities to be a service. When you're looking for constantly try to do things better, opportunities do arrive and it's, it's, an important, it's important to take advantage of them. When we had our grocery store in Las Vegas, New Mexico, customers would call us on Sunday and and we'd open the store special for them, you know, because they were good customers and, and they needed something. So we dedicate ourselves to taking care of the customer, whatever that might be, and uh, just constantly be on the aware. Besides being prompt and giving them proper service and giving them the orders, you know, the ordinary things that everybody else does, I think uh, a lot of little extra things are important that maybe somebody else might not do. Boy, and, and growing up in the business and, and working the business, I wore so many hats. I mean, uh, one hat one day and another hat the next day. And, and I think that versatility has really helped us to be a strong company. And uh, I was good at that. I, I worked hard. And then I had a tremendous partner in my wife. She, uh, she helped me in business a lot because I used to have to entertain suppliers. Had about 35 suppliers. And they, they all loved to eat at our house. So she got to know all the suppliers and they got a good home cooked meal which you know when you're on the road that you, it's pretty sad you know and it's it's uh, it's a great feeling to be able to go to a nice warm home a nice family and and break bread with them and she's done that and she's done it gracefully and and then she's a good businesswoman on her own besides but she's been a great mother a great partner for, for 43 years so I'm very fortunate in having a woman like Dee. Great, great individual. <laughs>